Hello, soundies. Welcome to our sound for video session. Today we have a microphone stand right here, and you'll understand why here pretty soon. <laughs> Welcome to our sound for video session. So glad you could join us. And today we have some exciting things to talk about. So let's just jump on over to our agenda here and we'll take a look. So first up today, let's talk about our signal chain. It is a signal chain we've used a number of times and what you're hearing right now is the Earthworks Ethos, which is the microphone right in front of me here. And then that is coming into the Rupert Neve Designs Shelford channel. That's going into the Canon C70 camera at line level. And then that's being sent to the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO via HDMI, already encoded in digital format. So the, the converters we're using are in the camera. And then that is sent out to the Epifan Video Pearl 2, which is encoding it and sending it over to YouTube. So that's the entire signal chain for today. We'll be switching over. We'll be listening to the Zoom F8N Pro a little bit later on, and that's going line level into the A10 Mini Extreme ISO. So you'll get a chance to hear what that sounds like, and we'll use the auto mix and have, that's that's why Danny's, uh, that's why there's a microphone stand <laughs> in the shot here. That'll be Danny's mic. All right, uh, coming up on May 1st, we have set a date and we're very much looking forward to the Dialogue Edit Mix Master Challenge. Uh, so get your 30 second or shorter, uh, mostly dialogue mix ready. We'll have some, we, they were originally called judges, but what, what, they're really um, people that work in the industry in various, doing various things, whether they're podcasters, dialogue editors, um, and they're going to be able to provide you some feedback on your mix and help you understand uh, how to make it better, potentially. What you'll do is you'll submit a 30 second or less uh, mix, again, primarily dialogue, and then also a list of all the things that you did to process it and how you recorded it. And with all that information, we should be able to get some great information from these folks to help you make your mixes um, especially your dialogue edits, even better. So look forward to that on May 1st. We'll have more details as we get closer about how to submit your um, your little clip. And um, we'll have more details on that as we get closer, as I said. Okay, next, uh, the Zoom F3. We talked about last week, this tiny little 32-bit float to XLR input recorder. I do want to make one correction to things that we talked about last week. So uh, one of the things that I said was that you cannot change the levels at which this records. Turns out you actually can. Um, there's this, remember we talked about there's an amplification settings controls that you have here. And my impression was that, that during recording, and this is true during recording, all that does is changes the output or the levels of the line output and the headphone output. However, if you change that amplification level before you start a recording, it actually also affects the recording level. And it's not a gain setting, it is actually a fader setting. So just so that you're aware, it's still making the change in the digital domain. It's, it's boosting the levels in the digital domain. Um, but I just wanted to make that correction. And of course, as we get closer to the final review for the F3, we'll be talking about the details on that. So just wanted to clear up any confusion I may have created there. <clears throat> Uh, next up, we're going to talk about the Zoom F8N Pro 32-bit float audio recorder. This is our initial look. I have not spent a lot of time with this recorder. I've made a recording that we're going to listen to here just to take a listen to the 32-bit uh, float recording capabilities and see what that looks like in post. Uh, my video that I posted this morning on the Rode NTH100 headphones was recorded in 32-bit float with the Zoom F8N Pro. Uh, so you can hear a little bit about how that sounds. I was, I was a little allergy. I had some allergies when I recorded that, so excuse the kind of stuffy sound, but um, otherwise that gives you a sense for, for what that sounds like. And then we'll jump over to our question and answer session. So let's go ahead and jump into the Zoom F8N Pro. Danny's going to switch us over to the overhead camera here. All right, we've got this set up here. I've got two microphones. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to those microphones so you can hear what it sounds like. So let me bring mine in a little closer. And here we go. Okay, we are now on the Zoom F8M Pro. That's what you're hearing right now. And Danny, are you over there? Yes, I'm over here on a mic, which I forgot to notice what it is. It's a, I mean, which one it is. It's the Shure KSM8. This is the Shure K... SM8. Oh, KSM8. Yes. Okay, got it. <laughs> Um, 
All right, and we also, you'll notice the uh, over here, we have the auto mix on, so that when I'm talking, it's pulling Danny's levels down, and then when Danny talks... 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You're quieter than you were before. I am? Let's see. Okay, I'm going to talk now. You? I'm talking now. Yes, I am talking. I'm You're talking into this. I'm talking into this mic, which is the sure something or other. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yep. There we go. So that may be a little hot. We'll see how things go. We are in 32-bit float mode, but the interesting thing is with this, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting very excited because this is a pretty neat recorder. <laughs> but what I want to talk about first is the fact that I'm going to turn these uh, levels down a little bit in the headphones just so that it's not quite so prominent there. Um, a couple of things. So first of all, 32-bit float recording. And in addition to that, you'll notice that we still have trim. We can still set our uh, gain levels. In fact, let me go over here. So right now, my microphone is set to 42 dB of gain, and Danny's is set to 54 dB of gain. Hers is a dynamic microphone, so hers needs a little bit more gain. Um, but... This is in 32-bit float mode. And just to confirm, I want to make sure, does this sound, do we still get sound? Yeah, we do. When I go into the menus, I just want to make sure. If we go to the record menu. We are indeed in 32-bit float mode at the moment. So um, what what it also does, now we talked about this in, when we talked about 32-bit float audio recorders a few weeks ago, one of the things, and actually last week when we talked about the Zoom F3, one of the things we talked about was the fact that sometimes using 32-bit float with live sound for live streams, for live in-person performances can be a little bit problematic. And that is because you can, you know, if you exceed zero dB full scale, then when that audio comes out of an analog output to be played back in a speaker or headphones, it is, it will clip um, unless you have a limiter on the output. And in fact, that's one thing that they've added here. If we look at the output here, we have an output limiter. And I am coming out of the sub out right now. You can see it's turned on. It is a hard knee limiter. And I think in this case, it is, yeah, just a basic on off. Um, and you, you have some parameters that you can set there. You can set the, ta the attack time, the release time, and the threshold. And in fact, that threshold probably should be a little bit lower. Let's maybe go somewhere in the minus 4 dB range. So that's what that is all about there. So this will help prevent those overloads on the output so that the signal will not be clipped. And so right now, again, we're in 32-bit float mode, but I have the output limiter set so that if we do get a little bit crazy on our levels, that um, it'll catch that before it goes out and gets digitized in the ATEM Mini Extreme in this case. All right, so that's the interesting thing. Now, the question that came to my mind, and I, I wanted to do a little experiment with this, is if you can set the gain, does that mean that I could potentially clip or distort at the analog preamplifier? Because that's before the conversion takes place. And this is an interesting thing I did. So we'll, we'll switch over to the Mac here, and I'll show you a recording I made. In this recording here, you can see here, this is heavily clipped. This was at plus 75 dB of gain on a condenser microphone. This one, we brought it down to a more reasonable level about where I would normally record. So we are peaking somewhere around, uh, let's see, minus 3.6 according to this. And then I also turned it down to its lowest gain setting with it, which is plus 10 dB. And here we're peaking at minus almost 38. So <laughs> on a condenser mic. So the question I had was, okay, what about this? Is this recoverable? Because I had the gain way up at plus 75 dB. And I was really curious to hear what happened. So for those that are not familiar with what distorted um, audio sounds like, let me just give you a little sample here. I'm going to um, go ahead and pull this down here. Don't want anyone ear, anyone's ears to get hurt. So we're gonna move the fader to minus 15. We'll come back over here and let's play this back here. Here's a recording to test the 32 bit float capabilities of the Zoom F8N Pro. Okay, we're going to pull it down even more. 
Let's go minus 20. Okay. Here's a recording to test the 32-bit float capabilities of the Zoom F8M Pro. Currently, I... Okay. I think that's enough of that. <laughs> uh, so that's what that sounds like. So if we come into Isotope here, and I want to go back to this selector, I'm going to go ahead and highlight the clipped portion here. And right now you can see its true peak is coming in at plus 26.7 dB. So I want to reduce it by about 28. So in our gain module here, I'll just bump that down. That looks a lot better. Let's go ahead and switch our fader back up here. So we should be in a better spot now to play this back without hurting anybody's ears. And let's go ahead and listen to what that sounds like. Here's a recording to test the 32-bit float capabilities of the Zoom F8N Pro. Currently, I have the gain set to 75 dB with a condenser microphone, namely the Earthworks SV33. Okay, so that sounded pretty good. Let's compare it here to this clip, what was which was recorded at a much more reasonable gain setting. Okay, the gain is now at a much more reasonable 45 dB. And I would say this is probably closer to where we'd want to be normally. We're peaking between minus 6 and minus 12 dB full scale. And this is what this sounds like when we record with the Earthworks SV33 into the Zoom F8N Pro. Let's go ahead and drop the gain down again and see what we get. Here's a recording to test the 32-bit float capabilities of the Zoom F8N Pro. Currently, I have the gain set to 75 dB. Interesting. So it does sound a little bit different. I'm wondering if that's because of its overall level. So it's at minus 22 there. It's at minus 24.8 there. Let's bump this up to minus 22. I want to play them side by side. So I'm going to play the one, this one first, it was recorded with a gain set at uh, 45 dB, I think it was. And then I'm going to hop back over here where we recorded at 76 or 75 dB of gain, just to see if they if the timbre's any different. At a much more reasonable 45 dB. And I would say, this is probably closer to where we'd want to be normally. We're peaking between minus 6 and minus 12 dB full scale. And this is what this sounds like when we record with the Earthworks SV33. Here's a recording to test the 32-bit float capabilities of the Zoom F8N Pro. Currently, I have the gain set to 75 dB with a condenser microphone, namely the Earthworks SV33. Okay. I don't know if, if y'all can hear that. It's, to me, it sounds a touch different, a little bassier. Um, so it's like that preamplifier is saturating a bit. So that's that's an interesting thing. This is interesting to me. So on the Zoom F3, um, let's go back to our main cam here. So on the Zoom F3 that we looked at last week, there is no gain setting. You do not have any control whatsoever over the gain setting. But on the F8N Pro, you do. And what's interesting to me about that, and that was actually the similar approach that sound devices took with their MixPre 2 series, when they introduced 32-bit float, you still have gain control over the analog preamplifier. And what that means is you can actually tune the sound that you're capturing, uh, which is really interesting. And and so you, I think that was illustrated a little bit here. If you were using good headphones, you could probably hear the difference when we were pushing 75 dB of gain and a condenser microphone it was sounding a little bit more saturated, a little richer on the low end, if that's a sound you're going for. Um, and then it sounded a little bit more natural when I had it gained up at 45 dB of gain. So closer to where you normally would set the gain um, if you were recording in a 24-bit recorder. So kind of an interesting thing. Let's go over to the stuff that was recorded at a much lower level. And we'll go back to the Mac here and take a look at that and see what we can do here. So right now, this is, we've got, almost 38 dB of headroom. And so we can definitely bump that up. Let's see if we just bump it to 22 and see what happens. Okay, let's play this back and see how that sounds now. Okay, and here is with 10 dB of gain. Uh, again, still the same microphone, the Earthworks SV33. And let's see what happens now. Right now we're peaking just over minus 46 dB on the dB full scale meter on the Zoom F8N Pro. 
and again still recording with the Earthworks SV33. See what it sounds like. Okay, pretty good, not bad. So uh, they're off. You know, we'd want to do some tests to see what's happening with the noise floor, and there's there's some other things going in here. That's a lot of that's practical noise floor, from what I heard. There's just some room noise in there. So in any case, that is a look at its 32-bit float capabilities. Let's go back over to the overhead camera now. Um, do we have any questions so far in the chat? All right, Danny's going to take a look, and we'll just catch some questions here as before we move on. Just going to take a look here. I'm I'm going to next. We're gonna we're gonna look through a couple of things here. Um, I do have the one question that came in from Daniel. I know was about the. Actually, let me come, pop back out here. I'm going to go into the channel one PFL menu. No, oh, do you run on the overhead? Yeah, we're on the overhead right now, so that's good. Um, uh, the input limiter. There is an advanced limiter, and you're hearing that right now. So if I get, you know, up close on the mic here. You can see what that's doing. Um, but what's interesting is we're in 32-bit float mode and that's still available. Um, I thought that was interesting. So we'll have to do some further testing there as well. Okay. Uh, the F8N Pro preamp is the same as the F8N. As far as I'm aware, yes, I don't know beyond that. I, my assumption is that almost everything is the same except that they've added multiple converters per input. Um, to me it sounds about the same so far. That's a subjective assessment. All right, Laurent. Is the sub out 1-2 output a 3.5 millimeter mini jack stereo line out output which can behave exactly like the Zoom H6 line out and can send audio to a stereo hi-fi system. Yes, um, it is. So it can send a variety of levels here. So if we go back to the overhead, Danny, on the output here, let's take a look at the output level for the sub one and two out. You can send the normal signal as line level, consumer line level at minus 10 dBV, or you can send a minus 40 dBV microphone level out signal as well. So you have a couple of different options there. So yeah, you should be able to send that to a hi-fi if you wanted to do that. Just like on the H6. Okay, that's amazing with 32-bit float. It is amazing. They've done um, amazing that it could be recovered. Absolutely. Um, I'm surprised myself. I think that speaks to... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not really 100% sure. I do. I th it does seem like the characteristic of the amplifier changes, the preamplifier changes a little bit, but that it was able to be reco recovered with, um, you know, by pushing it that hard is still pretty impressive to me. The recording at normal level sounds much better than the 32-bit float with post reduction. I think it certainly sounds more natural. Yeah, the other one is starting to sound saturated. To your point. Uh, Paul says, at the very beginning of the clip portion, I can hear a bit of analog saturation. Agreed. Um, what's the catch, LOL? Why don't we just use 32-bit float there? Um, well, the it's more expensive to implement. Um, you have to have uh, an entire pipeline. You know, your, your production and post pipeline all have to be 32-bit float capable. Um, if it is, then yeah, by all means, use 32-bit float. There's no problem with that. So I think it's a, it's a transition that it will take time. Is every single recorder in the future going to be capable of 32-bit float? I don't know. <laughs> I think we may start to see, um, you know, like single chip packages that would be able to do all of that, potentially. I'm not sure. Um, if I had to guess at some point, yeah, in the future we will. But there is also the fact that the process of uh, applying a crossover to two different converters and bringing the audio from the you know the loud audio and the quiet audio back together and making it sound very transparent there may there, that's a delicate process and there could be circumstances where that doesn't work really well in this case here we're just working with dialogue and so 
it's uh you know the dynamic range of the human voice is not that extraordinary so <laughs> or at least when when someone is talking like when i was talking in this sample so it's not really pushing the limits of that a lot but if you're getting sound effects that are incredibly dynamic um that's when you're going to want to listen for those kind of artifacts and there may be some costs there All right, teacher of teachers, admittedly, I'm obsessed with the functionality of limiters because I'm a solo filmmaker and can't monitor everything. If you know, is Zoom still using digital limiters on this unit? It's my understanding that they are, yes. The advanced hybrid digital limiter, uh, advanced hybrid limiter and the standard limiter are both digital. The advanced limiter has to be digital in particular because what they're actually doing is they're delaying the audio by a couple of milliseconds so that the limiter can react before uh, a transient gets all the way up to zero dB. So there's still some of that going on. So that, yeah, it's, it's very much a digital limiter. In 32-bit float mode, is the range of gain available the same as when not in 32-bit float mode? Yes, it is plus 10 dB to plus 75 dB. In fact, we can double check that. Um, Actually, I don't know if I want to change the the uh, bit depth while we're on this. Let me switch back over. Give me just a moment here. Okay, I'm back over on, I'm not on the Zoom F8N anymore. You're not hearing the Zoom F8N anymore. So let's go into, let's go into channel three. I'm going to go ahead and turn, let's pop out. Turn channel three on, go into the pre, actually we don't need to, oops, go in there. So if I come over here, lowest setting is 10 dB, max setting is 75 dB. Okay, so I'm gonna pull that back down. Let's go into 32 or 24 bit mode. Now I'm in 24 bit mode, popping back out. Uh, let's go into gain plus 75 dB down to 10 dB. So yeah, the answer is yes. It is the same in either mode. So I'm gonna go and we'll pop it back into 32-bit float. Okay, let's see what else do we have in the chat there. Hi Curtis, has the headphone preamp improved? I don't know. Let me plug in a set of headphones and let's see what I can tell you subjectively at least. Actually, I'm not going to plug in those. Let me grab another set. These are Bayer Dynamic DT900 Pro Xs. All right, now I'm, I'm hearing myself on that. And let me just crank the headphone. Uh, hmm. I'm going to have to do some some more extensive te testing. I assume it's the same. It seems colored. It seems to have quite a bit of high frequency to it. A little bit of emphasis in the high frequencies, um, which I think was the case with the, the original F8 and the F8N as well. Um, so I'll take a closer look at that. From, my, from what I, my initial sense is that it's probably the same. So good question there. When you're recording, can you enable disable inputs from the front screen? Let's go ahead and go back to the overhead and let's see. Okay, so right now I am not, uh, you're not hearing the Zoom F8N. Excuse me, because I don't want to uh, mess with that. Let's see if we can disable inputs. No. No, that looks like they're, they're shortcuts. Yeah, they're basically shortcuts while you're recording, it looks like. So the channel buttons, that's the hold button. So they become shortcuts. As far as I can tell, you can go into the menu. Let's see if I can enable things here. Let's go to input five. No, we don't see it there. As far as I can tell, you cannot do that while you're recording. You have to do it when you're not recording. So yeah, it looks like in between takes is when you would do that. Enable or disable inputs. Good question. All right, Paul. T 
Do you think that 113 dB of analog to digital converter dynamic range stated in the manual for F8N Pro is a typo? I guess it should be 131 dB. I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and I don't have a whole, I mean, a lot of microphones can't necessarily capture a dynamic range that, that wide. So not sure. I mean, even when you see a dynamic a microphone that can handle like 130, 135 dB SPL, a lot of times their dynamic range spec is substantially lower than that. So um, I don't know. We'll see. I will try to do some recordings that will simulate that and see what we can get. Are they the same look-ahead limiters like on the old F8N? From from what I know, yes. Um, I was looking in the... Let's look in the manual here. Let's just take a look at the limiter. Um, we'll take off all that search. Why is it still highlighted? I'm not sure. Done. Okay. All right. The limiter can prevent distortion by controlling input signals that have excessively high levels. When the limiter is on, if the input level exceeds the set threshold value, the signal will be suppressed to prevent the sound from distorting. The attack time is how long after the signal exceeds the threshold before the limiter starts operating. The release time is how long after the signal goes below the threshold before the limiter stops operating. You can change these two parameters to adjust the sound quality. Okay. Turning the limiter on and off. That's pretty straightforward here. Here it talks about, here's an, ex, here's an explanation. Okay, so it, it calls out the difference between the normal limiter and the um, advanced limiter here. And so it looks like it's it's working the same way. From all the description I'm seeing here, it looks like it's the exact same from the F8N Pro. Um, it's an infinity to one ratio, and it sudden peaks are suppressed by detecting maximum levels in advance. So it's applying that that delay of a few milliseconds, and it's actually one millisecond. Excuse me. Uh, the increased latency can cause interference between sound transmitted through the air source and the delayed monitor sound, possibly making accurate monitoring of the sounds difficult. Um, sample rate cannot be set to 192 kilohertz when you're using the advanced limiter. Uh, yeah, everything looks the same so far, except what, what was interesting to me as I'm scrolling here, apologies for that. Let me just do a page down at a time. Okay. So when you use the advanced hybrid limiter, in the past you just had basically one setting, and that was the target level, which is coming up on the next page here. And that looks to be the case here still. So when you have it set to the advanced limiter, let's go ahead and go to the overhead camera. We pop out here into the input, input limiter on advanced, yes, and the only setting you have is the target level. So from what I can tell from the documentation and what I can tell from what I'm hearing so far, it does appear to be the same as in the F8N, and it was also actually backported to the F8 and the F4, um, and I believe they also have the same ones in the F6. And the F3 does not have a limiter. So, yeah, as far as I can tell, it's the same thing. Um, listening tests may reveal something different, but from what I can tell right now, it's, it appears to be the exact same thing that was in the F8N, which is which is fine. The only downside of that particular approach, an all-digital approach, is that <clears throat> to make that work, essentially what they had to do was you set the gain on the F8N for your input, but what it's actually doing in the background is reducing that gain by 10 dB. And then it brings the audio in, takes it through the preamplifier, through the converter. And then if the particular sample that it's processing at that moment is not going to clip by adding 10 dB, it adds that 10 dB back. What that means is that it's potentially raising the noise floor. 
Is that problematic for a lot of situations? It may not be, um, but it does potentially raise the noise floor a touch. If it's, again, if it's working the same way as it did on the F8N, which it, from what I can tell so far, it does. So hopefully that makes sense. Mike. Mike is using the sub out on his F4 at mic level to feed the mic input of a camera and it works well, agreed. Um, what you're hearing here, I think works pretty well as well. So, and we're actually, we could do it either mic level or line, in this case we're doing line level and works nicely. All right, back to Laurent. All right, so the question is about the EA, uh, EXH6 input capsule. So that, I believe, is the one that includes additional XLR inputs. And the question is, can you get two extra XLR inputs? Will it be able to record 10 tracks on SD cards? It is a 10-track recorder. I don't know if that means you cannot record a mix at the same time that you're recording 10 isolated channels. That's not clear to me yet. I have to do some more research. But yes, you should be able to record two more inputs and get isolated channels. The question is whether you'll still get a mix as well if, if you want that. So I think that's the main thing to consider. And I'll have to look into that more. I don't know the answer to that yet. I don't have an EX H6 on hand to test it, but I should be able to, we should be able to find that just by doing some research. Um, okay, great. Question is, did you use a limiter on the high gain sample? Does it let it go over zero dB full scale? I did not use a limiter on that particular sample. So I don't know yet. Again, this is, I just want to be 100% clear. This is my first look at it too. <laughs> the only thing I've done so far is I recorded yesterday's session with it at 32 bit float and I've re and, um, recorded that sample that we showed just a few minutes earlier. I have been busy with lots of other things, but um, these are all great questions and we will. We'll take a closer look at that for sure. In fact, I can test right now if it'll allow it to go over zero dB full scale with a limiter on. I'm not gonna play it back to you, obviously, because that would probably be dangerous. Um, but what I'm going to do is let's go to the overhead camera, Danny. Let's crank the gain up to 75 dB again on this mic. Let me just double check that I am not, yeah, you're not hearing this, but I'm gonna get right up on the microphone all right, checking one, two, three. Checking, checking. Yeah, it looks like it does prevent it from going over zero dB full scale in 32-bit float mode as well, which is interesting. So you'll notice here when I'm right up on the microphone, notice how it's not hearing, hitting zero, but it is showing the limiter indicator, the little yellow line at the top there. Um, that appears. And in fact, if I change the limiter setting, let's do that. Let's change the target to... Let's make it minus 10, so it should be really obvious. Okay, if I get up really close, yeah, you can see it's definitely limiting it to minus 10. So the answer to your question is yes. Now, is that going to sound great? Not necessarily. <laughs> Could sound awful, but it does work. I'm going to pop that back up to a reasonable level. And go minus 3 dB. Okay. Another one. All right, so you um, you say it burned, so using 32-bit float burned us on a shoot where we were using our brand new F8N Pro, 32-bit float. All we got was static on the recording. We had advanced limiters on and using Bluetooth control, repeatable. Okay, um, you might want to get in touch with Zoom support to see if you've got some sort of defect there. Is there a way to leave 32-bit ISOs and 24-bit mixed down? Um, not that I know of. However, there might be, I wonder if on the mix track you can add a limiter on that. Presumably, here's a potential workflow that might make sense, is being able to record 32-bit float for the isolated channels, but for the mix you might want to, since you're maybe feeding it on an analog output to a camera, you might want to limit it. So you would just use the output limiter in that case. You could do that. That should, that should solve the problem. But getting static... 
is not something I've encountered yet. Um, and I don't know, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand what the use case would be to use the limiters and 32-bit float on the inputs. I can't think of what the use case for that would be. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Um, <laughs> so that, that would be the first thing I would, I would turn those, um, I would turn the limiters off and see if that changes things for you. But you'll probably want to, if you're getting just pure static, you'll probably want to contact Zoom support and just, just confirm that your unit is good. All right. That screen transition looks a bit slow, like it's maxing out its internal processor just to slow the meter, just to show the meter's view. Um, yeah, Zoom's UIs are not usually the, the fastest in the world. Um, I don't know. I don't know why the, why, I don't know what's causing that or, but yeah, that's a different experience than on some other higher end recorders. I don't know that it's maxing. I think it's just a transition in, I just did, wanted to do some sort of wipe type of transition. <laughs> not sure why they're doing that. Okay, we have two related questions two, from different people. Two related questions from different people. All right. Here's the first one. From Shoji, what makes the sound devices units better than this Zoom F8N? Build quality, sound quality, durable user interface. Well, I don't, here's the thing. I don't, I don't think there's a way to say that one is um, universally better than the other. I would say that different people using these devices may have different preferences and different um, priorities in terms of what they need. So I've tried to make it clear. I don't know that this message always lands, but I try to make it clear that for me, I prefer the Mix Pre series over the Zoom F series, but that doesn't mean they're better. That just means I have a preference for those based on the types of things that I do. So I think that's really important to, to keep in mind. The Zoom F8N F8N Pro, F8N, you know, the original F8, um, the build quality is quite good. I think part of the difference is that Zoom is, an, is a consumer electronics company that's creating a tool that's probably more likely to be used by prosumers and potentially pros, uh, whereas Sound Devices is a company that makes boutique professional gear that also now makes a mix pre, which is oriented more for prosumers. So it's like both both companies are coming from different places and converging in this kind of prosumer um, or entry pro level space. I, I, you know, those are horrible terms and I don't think they hold 100% true, but that's what I what we're seeing. And I think what that means in practical terms, the, the one concern I would have about using a Zoom F8 as my main mixer, if I were earning my full, you know, income from recording sound is that if it goes bad, I'm not really clear what happens as far as repair is concerned. Consumer electronics companies, a lot of times, uh, they don't have any, like, I don't know. I don't know what happens. Maybe someone out there has experience with that. I think what's more likely to happen is if, it, if the unit legitimately fails and it's under warranty, they'll send you a new one. Um, is, is my guess. I don't know. <laughs> I've never had one fail yet, so I'm not sure. But that's one consideration. I think a lot of people have this. Um, if you're working professionally with a tool, you want to be able to have the support of being able to have it repaired. Um, so when it is out of warranty, you know, even if it's, you know, if it's a $200 repair, that's a lot, lot less expensive than replacing the entire unit. Whereas on a consumer, on a product from the consumer electronics company, once it's out of warranty, if they don't do repairs, you're out of luck. Then it's like buy a new one or find a friend that's really good at DIY or you're really good at DIY, <laughs> whichever one of those it is. So that's one consideration. I think a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say they don't like the touch screen on the Mix Pre series. It's a much smaller screen than it is on the Zoom F8 and F8N and F8N Pro. So some people don't like that. Um, if you're working out where it's really hot, your hands are sweaty, the touchscreen is not always a great experience, so that's a consideration. Um, I've always found the preamplifier or the headphone amplifiers on the Mix Pre to me sounded better, sounded cleaner. Um, so I've always had an appreciation for those. So those are some of my thoughts, but I don't think there's a one there's one clear winner, one clear loser. It's not 
It's not like that from my point of view. It's it's what your priorities are. So let's go to the second one. I've probably beat that to death. <laughs> what is your choice? Sound devices, Mix Pre 10 or Zoom F8 and Pro? Probably the Mix Pre 10 would be my preference. Um, that Again, I want to be crystal clear. That doesn't mean that the F8 and Pro is a bad recorder. It's not. It's uh, just if I had to make a choice and I could only choose one, I would choose Mix Pre. That's just, I prefer the way that it works. That's all. Nothing beyond that. In terms of sound quality, you can get great recordings with both of them. And with the F8 and Pro, it's really, um, it's. I think it's neat that you can set the gain now. That's a that's a nice feature in 32-bit float mode. So you can kind of tune that sound, whatever you want. If you do want a saturated sound, now you can get a saturated sound. Okay, we have two more that are related. Two more related. All right. <laughs> to what you just said. According to your experience, do you think that this new F8 and Pro has improved in a way that you could compare it with another recorder like the Mix Pre 10 too? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was always comparable. Now it's even closer in, in comparison. Now it can. It also has the ability to set its gain, and it can, and it supports 32-bit float. So yeah, it's very comparable now. What would you consider the main competitors to the F8N Pro? Probably the Mix Pre 10 too. Um, that's the main competitor. Don't know of a lot of others. <laughs> uh, from Laurent, is the build quality the same for the F8N Pro for the F8N? Yeah, it seems like it's exactly the same. Um, the box, in fact, one thing that makes me chuckle a little bit: the USB port is a USB Mini. Um, on a device that just came out in 2022. Not a big deal for me. I mean, it's a little bit of a pain now. I have to have, you know, make sure I hold on to some USB mini cables, but um, they didn't change, from what I can tell, anything from the F8N. It changed, uh, the build itself seems identical, so nothing different. Physical differences other than the blue versus black color of the top and bottom. I haven't detected any differences whatsoever yet. The buttons and or the knobs and buttons all seem the same. Um screen seems the same the connectors all seem the same looks pretty much identical to me hi again i have a sony styled npf battery will that be able to power the f8n um not directly you would have to get some sort of battery sled that has a hiroshi output um I don't know if we can show that here. I don't really have it set up to show the side of the F8N. Actually, if you can switch to the overhead camera, Danny. Let me see if I can turn it without breaking anything. So right here, there's this Hiroshi input, this one right here. And um, if you can find a battery sled that takes NPF batteries, you can then, with an output, with a Hiroshi output like that, then you should be able to power it, yes, with NPF batteries. Otherwise, I'm just using a V-mount battery. Just, you can't really see it, but yeah, just a Cine battery, V-mount. And that has a D-tap output, so I have a D-tap to Hiroshi cable that powers the F8M Pro. Brian, sound device called, they say, check is in the mail. Um, <laughs> I wish, they haven't given me anything. Um, take that back, that's not true. They have given me a t-shirt, they've given me two mugs. One mug actually failed. Um, <laughs> after a year of heavy use. After a year, after actually probably a few years of heavy use. Um, mm -hmm. Danny filled it up one morning with a nice hot beverage and it kept leaking and she was like, what's going on? <laughs> and realized the cup was cracked. I'm not blaming sound devices for that. I'm sure they outsource those. Um, but, um, the, and then the other thing they did give me is that for my 888, they did give me a free license to the noise assist, which I pretty much never use. I did, I used it for the review. It's nice to know I have it, but I haven't used it beyond that. So those are the things they've given me. All of the other things that I've ever used from sound devices I've purchased with my own money. So I just want to be clear on that. And the F8N Pro, um, I bought this with my, with my money too. So it's not, I'm no longer, I have, Zoom used to send me early copies of things, but um, I did a review. They sent me an early copy of the Zoom PodTrack P4 I put the review out on on release day, and they were not the the headquarters people. I don't think the the U.S. the Zoom U.S. people were as concerned about it. But the um, I criticized because from my perspective, there were the the headphone amps weren't that great, um, and the I think as in essence what happened was that the the Zoom Japan headquarters people basically said 
you know, ask him to take that down. So I took it down, but then I bought my own PodTrack P4 and then put the review back up. So um, that's what I'm planning to do with these kind of things going forward on the bigger priced items. Thing, I'm, I'm going to, um, on the recorders at least, I am going to buy those and we'll do our own review without any sort of sponsorship from any of the manufacturers. I don't, I don't want to have that hanging over me and I don't, I don't think it's valuable to you when that's the case. So that's going to be my policy on the recorders. So, so Brian, I, do, I wish there was a check in the mail, but there is not. No, I actually, I don't wish there was a check in the mail. So, <laughs> and there's not one. Uh, from Roland, what I don't understand is why neither sound devices nor Zoom are network enabling their field recorders. Sound devices all the way for me, by the way. Um, sound devices is network enabling their eight series recorders. So... Um, they are not network enabling their prosumer recorders, so I just want to clarify that. So both the 888 and the Scorpio are Dante enabled. The 8, the 888 has a single uh, RJ45 jack, so it doesn't have redundancy. The Scorpio actually has two RJ45 jacks, so it has full redundancy as well. So um, just just so you're aware, that is something that the the higher end recorders do, and the prosumer level recorders do not do. It, it just raises the cost, Roland, and, and the complexity, I think, and potentially the size. On the, on the current platforms they've built, could they do it with their current form factors? I would be really surprised if sound devices could do it with the current mix preform factor. I just don't think there's enough room for that jack and, and potentially whatever electronics need to be in there to support it. Um, and the Zoom F8N and the Pro, its form factor might be able to, although... It would be a stretch as well. So they'd have to change their form factor as well, most likely. Hi, right, Will. Thanks so much for the super chat. Speaking of which, we need to get to the questions. I know, Will, you submitted a question. And let's go ahead and go over to those. Oh, wait, there's another one. Camille, thanks so much for the super chat as well. Danny just made sure that I, I re responded to that. <laughs> there are lots of other great comments. Thank you, everyone. But okay. We have to move ahead. Okay, we're moving ahead. And uh, we may, if we have time, we're going to come back. For my next production, this is from Olaf. I'm on my way to buy a field recorder. The choice between a MixPre or the F8N Pro or not is quite difficult for me. One question is if the F8N Pro also, like the MixPre, has a possibility to use the channel fader as a gain trim during recording. And the answer to that, if we go to the overhead camera, is if I come down here, I believe the system menu, track knob option, you can make it a trim, a fader, or for a mixer. So yes, you can change it to trim, Olaf, to answer your question. It can be done to do that. And what you can also do in this mode that we're in right now is you can actually use the menu encoder knob right here, and I can just click on here to change the uh, gain setting, the trim. So that is an option. So yeah, you can you can definitely do that. Okay, next question from Bill. Do you have a recommendation for an entry level sound monitor for a director? So I think you're referring to IFBs or interruptible foldbacks or um, context style things. Uh, this was a first-time expectation for a recent gig I did, and I just used some headphones and a Sennheiser G4 system for the director sent out of X1, X2 from a MixPre 10.2. But going forward, I'm wondering what a reasonable kit would be to not only provide for this, but also for script supervisor or others. This gig also had walkie-talkies for production communication, and I'm wondering about integrating with those. So there's a lot there. I, I'm not going to be able to talk about the integrating with walkie-talkies or comm systems right now, but let me just show you... Um, one thing you might consider is um, this here, IF Blue, is a fairly relatively low cost. Um, this is a, this is it. It's at uh, True Audio. It's three hundred ninety nine dollars per belt pack receiver, and then you can use Electrosonics IFB transmitter to go with it, and then just hook up a pair of headphones to that. So, if you do need to build out your kit, this is probably one of the first ones I'd look at. Um, again, you are going to need one of the the, the Electro uh, IFB transmitters as well to outfit your entire kit but it looks like a pretty good system it um, looks like, I think it was a different company that was producing it but now Electro I don't know if Electrosonics bought it from them or distributes for them I'm not sure which it is but 
Um, I believe that there's probably some service um, and support as well from Electrosonics on these. So probably that's the direction I would look. I do, my, me personally, I just have a Comtex system with uh, one transmitter, two receivers. They don't sound very good. It's not super impressive for the, <laughs> for the director or producers or whomever is using it. Um, but I've got it if I need it. And, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going with the Comtech. All right, next question. Next question is from Will. I use the Zoom F8M Pro as an audio interface to record remote business meetings. Does the audio interface mode disable the iOS app? And if so, how could you use the iOS app to first set up the scene and take information, including what um, SD chip it records to beforehand, and then, of course, take over with the F8N Pro during the actual recording? Um, I was looking for that ahead of time, Will. I don't know the answer for 100% sure, but I believe that, yes, you can use the iOS app or you can use it as an audio interface, but you cannot do both at the same time. I need to double check that. Um, if that's the case, then you would just set it up with the iOS app and then and then jump out of that, you know, disable the Bluetooth and then start using it as an audio interface from there. So I don't think it's a really straightforward workflow, but in my final review here, I'll work, I'll make sure that we get a clear answer to that as well. So more to come in short. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and check the chat and see what else we've got out there. Danny said there are the, 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 there's a lively chat today, <laughs> which I love, which is awesome. It's a, it's a good community that has a lot to talk about. Okay. Um, Eric says, kudos to you on the matter of the Zoom Pod Track P4 in terms of reviews. That's how cons uh, Consumers Unions runs the Consumer Reports reviews. Yeah, I think that's that's the best way to do it. You're not, it's, it's very awkward otherwise. Yeah, that was a super chat. Thank you for that. Eric, I appreciate the chat, the super chat as well. Harry, can I have wireless receivers in my sound bag close together without signal issues? Rode Filmmaker 2.4 gigahertz wireless units. Thanks. Um, 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 um. You may need to give them some space. Um, however, Rode did release a product a while back before the wireless Go 2 came out. They had a they released a little bracket that fits into the shoe on your camera and it spaces the receivers apart and they're not that far apart. Um, I'd probably use that as a guide, but if you could put in, you know, maybe at least um, eight centimeters more if, you, if you've if you got the space for it, I would, I would spread them out if you can. It's just gonna make things a little easier potentially and experiment too. Um, wireless is an interesting thing. There are lots of, of things that change. You move just a just a little bit and everything can change. So <laughs> definitely do some testing there to see what works best. But yeah, I'd try to move them apart if you can. Okay, this is near the beginning. Brian says, good review of the Rode NTH100. I bought an Audio-Technica ATH M40X. Congratulations on the new headphones. I want to just say one thing about headphones. I did release a video this morning and I haven't had a chance to go and put a pinned um, comment on it, but I want to underscore the fact that with headphones, you have to go try them yourself. There is no way that any reviewer can um, <laughs> give you a review that, and including me, that that really, I think, provides a really great recommendation. Um, you can use those reviews as data points, but I would always, always, always go try those headphones first and as much as possible because there's just so many factors. People's heads are shaped differently, ears are shaped differently. Um, ear canals are different. The nerves between your ears and your brain is, are different in just so many factors. It's really important to find something that's going to work well for you. There's no, in my mind, there is no such thing as the perfect set of headphones, no matter how much money you spend. Okay. All right. Near the beginning. Hi, Curtis. Love your videos. What is your go-to type setup for corporate interviews? Lav plus shotgun. Which do you prefer in the mix? Thanks. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you. Um, well, it depends. Uh, typically in the past when I did, when I was uh, the operator, I would generally do a lavalier and a boom mic. So, and then in post, I would choose which one I wanted to use based on how, which one sounded better. Um, and oftentimes it was the boom mic, although if there's a lot of room noise, sometimes the lav mic would give better results. So 
that's how I generally approach that. Now I'm working at a company called Webflow. We have a studio set up. In the studio, we just use boom mics. We don't bother with lavalier mics in those situations because we have control over the space. And in that case, the, the boom mic always sounds great. So that's how we approach it there. But yeah, if you're on location, um, setting up in a space that's normally a work office space, I, I definitely do both and then choose whichever one sounds best in post. And, and also try to optimize the sound for each. So if I've got a boom mic, I've got an air conditioning or, or a HVAC vent or register nearby, try to get the, the null part of the microphone aimed that way so that I'm going to reject as much of that noise as possible. All right, Shoji, on these 32-bit float recorders, are they able to indicate when the inputs are overloaded and or the actual mic has reached its limit on the maximum input SPL? They don't have any sort of indicator um, on the meters. In fact, let me go back over to the overhead here and let's go into the input here. Let's turn the limiter off on input number one. I have the gain set to 75, and you can see that the meter is just pegged up against 0 dB. So the meters don't change in this case. They are still dB full scale. Um, you know, the traditional meters we would typically see on a 16 or 24 bit recorder. And um, so you don't get any sort of indication. In addition to that, it doesn't have any way to know that a microphone necessarily has, um, has saturated, has reached its max SPL either. So it doesn't have any way to do that. And as far, you know, I, I could something be developed to do that I imagine um, that'd be tricky business though I don't know it's a good question but I would say right now the answer is no based on what I've seen Brian I find using a stylus for the small touch screen works well speaking of I assume about the mix pre so yeah that can be a, a good option if you're if you like to work that way definitely legitimate Bill, thanks for doing these. You're absolutely welcome. And thanks for the, the question, Bill. I did get your email, so, um, and we added that to the list here. So thanks so much for submitting your question. All right, Marcus, I'm interested in recording a couple of vocalists at once. What kind of devices would I need to allow them to adjust their own voice levels and the mix they hear separately? Ah, uh, I don't know if you're in studio and or like during a concert. Um, there are now devices that that work with a lot of the mixing boards that you'll find certainly for concerts, um, for live sound reinforcement that uh, that give the performers their own their ability to set their own mix to adjust their levels versus all of the other instruments and microphones in the band. Um, I know that. Gosh, who makes them? I think Alan and Heath make some of them. I think a bunch of, I think Bar Behringer might even be making some of those. I'm not positive. I don't work in that space a lot, so I don't know, but that's one way to approach it. Um, if you just want to give them a headphone amplifier, um, you could run a feed from the headphone amp out to a headphone, um, another box near where they're going to be performing that, that just gives them basically a volume level. Um, you did say for headphones, a little over. Yeah, it doesn't, wouldn't necessarily allow you to, they wouldn't be able to change the mix, but they would be able to adjust their volume. That's basically all that would do. The other devices I was talking about initially, I think, would also allow them to adjust um, at least everything else versus their levels. Um, so I don't know, I don't even know what those boxes are called. They're usually called like, um, like personal mixers or something like that. And they usually, a lot of times you'll see at a lot of concerts I've been to, leading uh you know in the last several years you see them on their mic stands or like if they have an instrument um like a like a guitar stand or something sometimes i've seen them over in those areas too so they usually clamp them to some other stand and they can adjust those oftentimes it's for wireless as well all right what plugin or overlay would you use if sound if the sound you want to record is lower than the background light cooling fan mm, I if I understand correctly if you're saying that the sound that you wanted to capture is quieter than the fan in the light in the space that you and you don't want that sound of the fan um, there's no there's no great way to solve that problem as far as I know aside from getting the microphone really close to the soft sound source um, 
you have to use you have to get a, a good signal to noise ratio that's a that's a fundamental of audio recording so if the fan is making more noise than the sound source you're trying to capture and your microphone is equidistant between them you're going to have a mess or if it's even closer to the fan and the light that's that's even worse so you just you have to optimize in some way you have to get that microphone closer to the sound source you want in short Uh, in case mine passed by, how does the F8N Pro sound versus the F8N? Does it have an opening for the snap-off parts like an H8? Yes. Hammett, yes, it sounds exactly the same to me, and uh, except in 32-bit float mode, in which case it will not distort if you go above 0 dB. And it does have the, um, the little port for... In fact, let's see if we can show that here. This is kind of in the way there. There we go. But yeah, you have this port right here, which allows you to connect the Zoom accessories. So yes, it still has that very much. I think really, I would think of the Zoom F8M Pro as really just like a an iteration of the same product. It's not, to me, it does not seem like a brand new product. It is a, it has some new features that are really cool, but it is not like a, it's not a total redesign. And you can tell because they, <laughs> they kept... The, the, the packaging looks the same except a different color and the, I mean, the, by that I mean the case itself and the, they're still using the USB micro connector as opposed to a USB-C. So it looks pretty clear that they just, it's an iteration. Reset the multiple okay. Um, ME series for Allen and Heath, but B&H, or sorry, Allen and Heath also has mobile apps to let performers mix their own in-ear monitor aux send without touching anything else and then for the ultimate clang technologies thanks so much christopher so there's some good information there on the personal mixers mike i just i've just done some background reading on the dynamic range of typical analog to digital converters 113 db is pretty good for prosumer gear 131 db would be stratospheric agreed <laughs> All right. Uh, Danny says we're at time, so we probably need to wrap this up. I wanted to say thank you, everybody. I know we just scratched the surface on the F8M Pro. There's a lot more to talk about, and we may be able to come back to it in our upcoming um, live streams here. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. In the meantime, get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye. <laughs>